everybody. We'll get to, we're getting just started, but we have to do one thing is if you're all for you to be quiet. I'm sorry, for you to be quiet so that I when I'm talking that the people on the screen can hear me, and then Eric will fix it so that the fo camera focuses on the speaker. So Bob, Bob Staley, wave at me if you can hear me. Wave, Bob. Okay, they all can wave. Okay, good. Linda, thank you. So they can hear hear me. Albert will be up here. So Albert, come on up here. This is, again, what we didn't have last week was me try with two helpful technicians. Uh, our senior pastor, Eric Barian, is with us today uh, in the guise of technician, a video technician. So we're very grateful for that. I am the Reverend uh, Dr. Michael Hageman, and I'm uh, the interim director for the Park Center, which is our co-sponsor for this uh, eight sessions together. This is session number two. We're working with the Arizona Interfaith Movement and Dr. Albert Solosa. And so today we are focusing on Hinduism. We're welcoming it to all of you. Uh, the Fran Park Center is kind of our educational wing of Pinnacle Presbyterian Church. Many of you may be familiar with it. We've got a lot of wonderful things coming up uh, this, uh, this spring. One of those, tomorrow night, is our inauguration of our Faith and Science series again. We're, um, we have Faith and Science Fiction tomorrow night. Uh, that's, uh, that event is will both be in our rehearsal hall and online, but uh, working with uh, somebody in our congregation just wrote his first novel, it's a science fiction novel, so we're looking at the place that Faith has played with um, you know, science fiction. It's very fun. But Saturday is the big event, working again with the Arizona Interfaith Movement. We have an interfaith tour where we're visiting three houses of worship, uh, Hindu, Sikh, and Buddhist. Uh, and so that you can talk to Kelly McGinn, who's there in the stripe, the stripe uh, sweater in the back. Yes, we'd love to meet you. We still that. have spots open. Spot, a few spots open. Uh, Twenty dollars for that, that. That we have a bus that'll meet here and going to the different spots. Uh, Plus lunch. Plus lunch. Uh, uh, it's a Middle Eastern restaurant in my neighborhood. We've made all the arrangements as a buffet lunch for us uh, all. Oh, so. you did. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now I so, enjoy. So excited about that. The, the guy who runs the restaurant place says, my wife is having a baby this week. I hope to see you. He says, but if I don't, uh, he says, everything will be arranged for us. So uh, that will all be good. So talk to Kelly McGinn. And if you're online, you, we can write in uh, for more information to Kelly McGinn. Anything else I need to tell Sounds us about? Sounds good. Let's get started. Okay. Today, Albert Solosa, and this is where our topic for today is Hinduism. you got to let me know when you want to run the... The video that you have prepared for. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes I will project my uh, professor's voice here so that everybody would be comfortable in terms of hearing me. I never cease to be impressed by uh, Pinnacle Presbyterian. Uh, 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 last uh, Sunday, I, uh, I, very early in the morning, I saw our senior pastor. Uh, <laughs> Eric, uh, out there before the festivities and the celebration. Uh, and, and so uh, what, what I'm most impressed with is the kind of support and the logistics and everything that, that people arrange uh, for here. So for today, our second uh, religion is Hinduism. And I think a lot of you might know already about Hinduism, and it's really most fascinating. And I would like to point out that in our audience, you will see her there on the screen, Krishna, Krishna Raman. Krishna, she's waving her hand. She is from India, and she moved here from Georgia, and uh, she is so knowledgeable, so once in a while, I will uh, refer to Krishna in terms of uh, Hinduism. Hinduism is so fascinating. It is a many splendored thing. Now, there's one thing, two things that I would like to share with you. Now. Hinduism is what we call their religion, but I would say their religions. But in, in, uh, in Sanskrit or in India, the religion is Sanatana Dharma. So Sanatana is eternal, and Dharma is translated in so many different ways. So one translation of the word Dharma is teaching, or instruction, or law. So it's the eternal law. Now, in some of our religions, we're so used to the fact that, you know, there's a whole hierarchy of priests, bishops, cardinals, and so forth. There's no such thing in Hinduism. My observation is that the focus in Hinduism are the gurus. And we uh, have 
gurus who are still alive and who are teachers. And I would say, I will have to confess to you now, to kind of make a statement that one of my gurus is uh, Eknath Iswaran. I stumbled upon his book, uh, take, take Your Time. And then from then on, I read almost everything that he wrote. He passed away in uh, 1999. He's, he's a man of the 20th century, but he was a teacher in Berkeley in meditation. So I consider him a guru. In fact, he is a very, very good interfaith guru. So what is your understanding of the term guru? What, translate for me. Guru. Good. Good. Yeah. Wisdom. Teacher. Well, teacher. Very teacher. simple. Teacher. Yeah. Somebody who brings enlightenment. So, you know, what about the word karma? See, let's... Uh, what? Cycle of life. Cycle of life? Karma? Fate. Fate? Okay, F-A-T-E, probably. Karma? Okay, uh, now... Accountability and consequences? Accountability and consequences. Uh, all the subtle translations of karma. Karma, uh, there's a word called karma yoga, which is uh, action. And the, the, the belief is that all our actions have consequences. We don't have to wait to, to, uh, to, to die and to be resurrected, to be judged, but all our actions. So there's action, reaction, consequences. So that's karma. Yoga, what is the meaning of yoga? <clears throat> yeah. Union. Union, very good. Yeah, and so yoga, might, you might say it's an exercise. It's a way of uh, strengthening your body and flexibility and all that. But yoga is union with God. And in the Bhagavad Gita, there is or there are discussions about how we can be in union with God. So the term Hinduism is a term that we outsiders or outsiders have given to what we perceive to be their religion. The word Hinduism is from the term Indus River. So this is the religion or the practice or worship of people from the Indus River. Uh, but I, as I had said, the, uh, the saying is Sanatana Dharma. Now, we are talking about the golden rule. And one of the most fascinating aspects that I will come and reiterate to you again and again is what is common in a lot of the religions and beliefs is something akin to the golden rule that is a term given by Christians. So in the Mahabharata, this is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. And so there's a certain sense that, oh, if I do this, this will cause pain. And if someone will do this to me, this will cause pain and sorrow. And so I don't want to do it to another person. And so it, there's a certain sense of and reciprocity. And can you imagine? In that, there is no kind of commandment as such, but you have to think for yourself. If I do this to others, they will be hurt, so I might as well not do this to them. Now, very easier said than done, right? It's very difficult, but it's a very good way for us to pause and to think in terms of our action. And so the word karma also means action. So karma yoga are the things that we do in order to achieve union with God. Okay, now you might ha have heard of the word ashram. Anybody? I visited an ashram. Yes, James. An ashram is like a monastery. It's a monastery or it's a place of worship. It's a place where people gather together and typically they gather together around a guru where they learn the teachings. Uh, and so I have to share with you one beautiful thing that happened to me a number of years ago. I visited the ashram in California of, uh, of uh, the hugging mother. Uh, and uh, she, she goes around the world and her ministry is that of hugging. And uh, she gives that, and, uh, and, so, uh, and so that is an ashram. So if we go to an ashram, Gandhi had an ashram. People gather together, they live there, they share things, they share the teachings, and, um, and they, share, uh, uh, they share life together. Now, the other word that might be known to you is the word ahimsa, 
What is, what is your guess? Yes, please. Non-harming. Yes, non-harming. Non-violence. Ahimsa. And it's a very, 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 very important teaching, not only in terms of Hinduism, but also Jainism. Uh, in fact, it's, it, 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 it is a very good moral or ethical teaching. What am I doing is intended not to harm others, but you have also to extend your vision. I do not want to harm animals, not just people. Uh, and then come April, when we have our discussion about science and religion, I do not want to harm the future. I want to care about my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. So then I do not want to harm the earth. And I do not want to harm their future and their resources. So come to think of it, we have in our vocabulary a number of words from Sanskrit. So S-A-N-S-K-R-I-T, Sanskrit. So uh, I would like to add another uh, uh, word in your Sanskrit vocabulary, and the word is puja, P-U-J-A, puja. And we have a video, and we will watch that video. And uh, puja is also an Indian name. Um, and uh, I, I happen to have attended an Indian wedding. Indian weddings are so beautiful, and they are the most lavish. They happen for at least three days. And I attended the wedding of Puja and Kyle in San Jose, California. And so we were celebrating. We celebrated for three days. And so this video is from the Smithsonian Museum, and also happily, by some happenstance, I was able to attend personally the exhibit right there when it was in the Smithsonian Museum. So let's, let's watch Puja and look at the things that you see. And uh, I will volunteer Krishna and myself if you, want, if you have questions. Uh, but I, I have been to India, uh, I, so I know a little bit. I, I studied uh, all this, and so we'll, we'll, we'll see what uh, Puja is. So do you have uh, what what uh, struck you? What 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 thoughts do you have before I? Ritual. Rituals. Okay, rituals. So rituals are very important. Where are rituals held? At home. Mm -hmm. So worship is basically at home. But one thing that I was so struck with uh, in in my visit to Sri Lanka uh, is that I mean, which is similar to to India. There's a lot of street shrines. And it's not only about Hinduism. It's about Buddhism. And it's about Christianity. Oh my God, you know, by the roadside, there's a huge statue of this, the sacred heart of Jesus. Uh, and so there is religion everywhere uh, in that sense. So yeah, ritual is very much available to all of us. So it's not just at the temple. Um, so it's practically every day I was at, the, uh, you know, at a temple and different types of temples. And different places can be temples or temple-like in the sense. So, yeah. Any other thoughts that you... Uh, yes, please. I thought that the concept of reciprocity yeah. was interesting to me. The fact that you're worshiping a God and, and you, then the God reciprocates to you what what that God represents. You so know, it's a two-way street. Yeah, uh, John Chapman, you you have you have that really on the dot. Um, one thing I in in my reaction to this video, I've seen this a number of times, but my reaction was, whoa, there's the golden rule. In my worship of God, in my surrender of God, God gives back to me, and in fact. I have to tell you, I, appreciated I appreciate Christianity, I am, more about learning about Hinduism. Oh, that's why reincarnation is there. Oh, that's why, uh, that's why we do this in the communion. Oh, that's why we have incense. And so my appreciation and my understanding of Christianity was really enhanced 
with learning about Hinduism. In fact, they're saying, if you just only know one religion, you don't really know, know it. And so, yeah. Ah, yes, please. I was just thinking, sometimes, though, yeah. the ritual overtakes the meaning. You wonder if all these people going through that really understand deeply. OK. My interpretation of that is this. Each individual person comes with a certain life circumstance. And so the meaning might be different from one person to another. It's not that they don't understand, but there is a lot of things that are embedded into it. Uh, I, I would love to use the word pregnant with meaning. And so the meaning is different. So for me, it might be that I'm encountering certain problems or questions in my life. And for me, the puja or uh, worshiping would mean this particular thing for me for this particular time. And so it really varies uh, from one person to another. Yeah. Let me uh, at least tell you some of the comments from online. So OK, please. People, yeah, we'd love to hear. One person says, I'm, I'm interested in changes in the caste system in this century. Yes. That, I don't know if you have, uh, but especially considering application of the golden rule. Yes, well, I will address the caste system. One, one I saw said, oh, some of the things they saw in the video reminded them of sacramental theology and Christianity. Right? Yes, uh, uh, the word sacrament, of course, you know, when you study, I guess, some, our reverends here, they, they did all these studies. When you study sa sacrament, uh, it's, it, it, it indicates the presence of God or God's presence, the sacrament of baptism, uh, sacrament of confirmation as such. And so... Uh, it indicates, or it is an indication of, of, of God's uh, presence. I will address the, the issue of, of the, the caste system. Uh, uh, now, if, if, uh, if you jump to the, the, the back page of your uh, handout, uh, there are four, four stations in life. Um, one thing that is very important to understand is the caste system is no longer legally in place. However, these traditions that have been going on for thousands of years are very difficult to eliminate. In fact, I think the caste system has become pronounced, my impression of it, when it comes to uh, finding a mate or a wife or a husband. You know, there are advertisements for finding husbands. In fact, uh, it's still quite common to have arranged marriages. And one of the things that they look for is the caste, uh, where's the family from? Uh, of course, you know, they, 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 they look at, you know, uh, the, 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 the background, the, the class background, and they also uh, look for the uh, ast astrological signs. Uh, Krishna, do you have any? Please chime in with me well, she, about... She has to unmute herself. Oh, unmute, unmute yourself first, Krishna. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Uh, when someone is looking for a mate for their son or daughter, those are considerations that you would go through. Are they, do they usually, it is, do they belong to the same caste? Do they come from a similar background? Yeah. Um, uh, educational, uh, you know, what education has the other person had? Um, financially, how is the family? Are they a single yes. family? And all of those things. So, um, Mine was an arranged marriage, and it lasted for 53 years. Yes. Um, you were brought up with the notion that you're going to go through a, an arranged marriage. So it doesn't seem uh, very, you know, uh, kind of different or, uh, you know, something uh, that I, you know, is unlikely. Yes. But these days, younger people do fall in love, and they do get married. They might be of different castes. And so that is, has started happening, which is a wonderful thing. But, uh, you know, arranged marriages generally are with the same uh, cast. cast. Yeah. So thank, thank you for that insight. Yeah. yeah. I have friends, Christian friends from yeah. India, long, uh, from Kerala. In yeah, South, from Kerala. Where Christianity yeah. has been there for a long time. Yeah. They moved to the United States, but for their daughters who are late teens, they're planning uh, arranged marriages as well. I mean, it's a... Yes. Yeah, so this is for yes. Christian Indians as well. Yeah. Yes. In, in fact, one of my friends in uh, Berkeley, a son of a professor of engineering, uh, yeah. he was born in the United States, but he went, quote, unquote, back to India and to find a mate. And then, of course, there's this whole 
uh, you will find this in Netflix. The whole, there's a matchmaker and the whole thing in terms of compatibility. Now, I, I think I have to tell you, uh, a lot of this uh, arranged marriages really work so well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, Krishna said, hey, you know, for, for, was married for 50 years or so. So, but let me go back to the caste. So the caste system is a heritage of, of past practice. However, it is very difficult to remove that. Now, so there is the Brahmin, the priestly caste. And there is the Kshatriya, the warrior administrator class, the Vaishyas, the merchants, the businessmen, and the Sudras, the unskilled laborers. And there are also people who are called untouchables. They are, they are and they continue to this day, it's, it's quite sad, you know, people working in, in garbage, in, uh, <clears throat> in the disposal or cremation of the dead, and so forth. But you have to consider that the Former people, uh, the people who were considered untouchables or what, they have really gone up. In fact, we have had presidents of India who are former untouchables. So, <clears throat> so there has been a change, but change is hard to come. But even with people coming to America or to Britain, they still follow some of these practices. And so uh, they, they, they truly uh, linger. So what about that in the golden rule? Well, um, one, one of the most revered uh, Hindus, uh, who is really, I mean, I, he is truly, truly Hindu, but he really has a very good interfaith background, is Mahatma Gandhi. And, uh, and in terms of changing, you know, changing some of the practices, and that's one of those practices that was uh, changed. So <clears throat> what do you think about the gods? For those people who are coming to our visit on Saturday, you will have a visual appreciation of the temple. In fact, one of the things that you will observe, it's not just a Hindu temple. You will, you'll find out. Yes, please. Um, in the video, I noticed that uh, they were preparing some of the statues, gods. Yes. How many gods they have in the Ah, OK. Now, you will, you will read in the literature 33 million gods. I think that's the highest <laughs> estimate that, that, that I have. However, uh, so there are, there are several interpretations, theological interpretation. One is <clears throat> there are many gods. <clears throat> there is only one god, Brahm, Brahman. But these are the various manifestations of the gods. So, so there are two ways of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is the notion of the incarnation of a god or the reincarnation of a god. Now, uh, 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 in terms of... Uh, in terms of Jesus Christ, Jesus is God incarnated, the incarnation of God. Uh, for Franciscans, uh, this Christmas is really the highlight of it all because God's incarnation happened during Christmas. So similarly, they, you have God's incarnating uh, gods. And so, so we talk about many and we talk about one in, in, in many ways. Any other observation? Yeah, yeah, James. I just wanted to mention, uh, according to a couple of different yeah. archaeologists, as well as yeah. Yogananda, a yeah. very famous yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Indian guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, yeah. uh, that Jesus spent time yeah. in India. Yeah, there, there is that speculation uh, uh, because um, the, if you, if you uh, have read the, 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 the Gospels, uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, it stopped at the point when Jesus was, uh, you know, young, and then there's nothing, and then all of a sudden, you have the opening of Mark, which is the baptism of Jesus, the inauguration of his ministry. Um, I, you know, uh, it's, I think it's a very kind of cute idea, but, but on the other hand, from an interfaith perspective, you know, some of our religions have a lot of similarities that, our guru in one religion is a guru in another religion. And so I would say that the, the wealth of the, of the Jewish tradition really has had quite a tremendous impact on Christianity. And we're finding similarities in terms of other uh, traditions. I so, mean, you have Abraham, who's connected with oh, yeah. Christianity so, as well as yeah. Islam. Uh, um, so uh, if you look into Torah, uh, start with Genesis chapter 11 on turning into fundamentalist. Uh, <laughs> you do have the Abrahamic chapters, right? And then with the focus on one God. And we, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, 
uh, tracing that. I've got a question about Pujas sure. again. Yeah. Uh, Pujas. This is yeah. very specific to context. <coughs> yeah. I'd like to know what Pujas might be relevant to a patient in the hospital here in the United States okay. that might comfort them in a way that allows them, that we as chaplains, that's what I am, yeah. could provide. And I just know that might be individual based on what I just saw. Oh, yes. Um, one, one, one thing that, that I can kind of foresee uh, from a perspective of, of a Christian giving a, uh, with me doing a puja myself uh, is, is, is having a space for meditation and a space where I can offer or I can make an offering of flower or, or of, uh, of, of, of something, you know, of an incense in that sense. And so, and then calling on to, calling on to a God or gods. Yes. 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 Knowing that we can't have flame in the hospital. Okay. Obviously, sure. Um, sure. Flowers and that kind of stuff. But I mean, is that something a family member might bring to that person in the hospital? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, I have to share with you one experience that I had when I brought my students. Uh, I will call in Krishna. When I brought my students to, the, to a Hindu temple, well, we brought fruits and we bought uh, we bought flowers, and that was offered. And um, uh, yes, Krishna. Uh, uh, one important thing for Hindus uh, before they pass away is to have a couple of drops of uh, the water from the Ganga or the Ganges River, yeah. which uh, is supposed to dissolve your bad karmas and uh, give you a good rebirth in the next life. That was a very important thing for dying Jews. Uh. I think from a Christian perspective, remember for people who, who went to the Holy Land, you can have a bottle of, of the, the water from the Jordan River or a, a bottle of water from the Lourdes uh, in, in, in France and so forth. That, that is some kind of connecting yourself with, with the eternal or a drop of the soil of, of the homeland. So there are many, many ways of, of really... Uh, and the other thing I think is uh, uh, probably the chance and uh, the, the chance of the sutras, that's another way, yeah, uh, that, that, that we can see. So from our outline, we find that, um, uh, we find that uh, also another similarity, Hindus have a trinity, the Trimurti, Trimurti. And then Christianity has God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Imagine those similarities. So that's why I tell you, study Hinduism, and you will appreciate Christianity even better. Uh, and, and because of all the, the similarities. Now, let me go to yoga. Um, one of my most beloved scripture of all the religions is the Bhagavad Gita. Now, there are two epics, two long poems and stories, the Mahabharata, the great Bharat, and, and then the Ramayana, the story of Rama, which is like the story of Odysseus. And so this... Two big epics are the sources of uh, Hindu tradition. So if you look at the scripture of Hinduism, it's hundreds of times more than Christianity. There's so many things and so many intricate things. I, I cannot, I think I need so many lifetimes for me to understand and not even enough to understand all this. Uh, and so I will rely on my Hindu friends. However, to me, one of the most key elements is the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of the Lord. And uh, there is a temple in Cambodia called the Angkor Wat. And they have a library. It's a stone library. And it's the story of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and so the Bhagavad Gita points out, uh, you have the teachings of Krishna. Krishna is teaching Arjun or Arjuna. Uh, what ought he to do? He's in the middle of battle. And so when you think about all this, think literally, but think figuratively. So what am I to do? So he's asking uh, uh, Krishna. And then Krishna gave him lessons. And I think one way of summarizing the lessons is the, the four yogas. And it applies to all of us, whether we are Christians or Buddhists. The first yoga is the yoga of knowledge. The way we learn things, the way when, when we know certain things, we appreciate them better. It's just like 
Um, at Arizona Interfaith, you might have a friend who is Buddhist, a certain kind of Buddhist, a friend who is a Muslim. Um, yesterday, I had uh, lunch with one, one of our Jewish members of the Interfaith Council. Well, he said you know, he had a really profound friendship with a Muslim. And so to know somebody, to know and have knowledge of somebody, then you get closer to God. Another one is the yoga of action. And I would say that uh, uh, Mother Teresa is revered in, uh, in, in India as a saint even before he was given, she was given sainthood by the, by the Vatican uh, because she did actions that are uh, dedicated to God. Um, and so, uh, and so, you know, all, all everything, everything that she does, it's, it's for, the, for the glory of God. And then you have bhakti yoga, you know, the yoga of devotion. And one of those things, manifestation is to bring flower or to sing, to offer up. And in fact, one of the beautiful things about Hinduism, and I would say Buddhism too, is it involves the body not just the mind. And so dancing. Uh, uh, I think Mike Wald is uh, on our screen right now. Uh, he goes to church with me at the Franciscan Renewal. We have liturgical dancers. So dancing is part of worship. Uh, I was something to, to, to put together a, uh, uh, some sort of a homily about dancing, dancing in the scriptures. And I would love to, <laughs> to show that, you know, our body is the way by which we dedicate ourselves to God. And then, of course, what we know is really Raja Yoga, the yoga of meditation. Did some of you get a mantra from uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation? There, no, no, Bob, you didn't? I know, no, I know, I know of it. Bob. You know of it, yes. Yes, I, you know of it. I remember during the 70s, you know, you will take TM, Transcendental Meditation, and then um, they will give you your secret mantra and then for you to, me to meditate. The other aspect of that is yoga. Uh, yoga is really very powerful. It is not just an exercise. It is truly a worship. It's really how I can be close to God through, th through, the, bo through the body and uh, and, uh, and, and so, there are various schools of yoga, by the way, and you've mentioned Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh, he is noted for Kriya Yoga. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, and his, his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, headquarters, I think, when, when, uh, is in, in LA. Yeah, and so, uh, once in a while, when I visit LA, I, I visit the, yeah. When you mentioned dancing as ritual, yeah. where would the whirling dervish uh, Ah. Okay, that's, that's connected. The whirling dervish, dervishes are a form of worship specifically in Sufi Islam. And you'll find them in, uh, uh, they, they, are, uh, they are Shiite, but then they're specifically Sufi. And one of those things is through dancing where they, they whirl around and they get into a trance. And uh, uh, yeah, so that, that is Islam. Uh, and, and one of the things in, 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 in that is an expression of love and a connection uh, uh, with God. So, so we are finding all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of things. And so one thing about Hinduism, uh, we cannot, I mean, I cannot learn about Hinduism in, in, in an hour. It's a whole lifetime. So uh, it's a ongoing learning. We have to talk to our friends and ask them what things are. But one thing is very important. They are visual, visual, because remember, not many people were literate across the world, right? And so you have to show certain images and to show that God is all powerful, what do you do? So you'll find God with many arms, with many legs, with many eyes. So God is all powerful, God is all seeing, God is all knowing. So that's the symbol. And so the symbol is like, uh, uh, also the, 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 the gods, the gods represent many different things. And so whatever they're holding and however the, the colors, God is also a sound. And the divine sound is, um, and that really, there's a certain vibration. There's a certain kind of feel to, to um. So God is, Visual, God is a sound. 
God is a feeling. This reminds me of uh, a passage in the Hebrew Bible when they said we didn't find God in the thunder or the, or the lightning, but in the silence, right? And so God is also uh, silence. Yes, uh, Patty. The question I have is, uh, in the video, it mentioned that Hinduism is about 3,000 years old. Yeah. That surprised me. I, I thought it was it predated Judaism. And well, it, it is really hard to date. See, for me, I have difficulty dating Hinduism and, and, and Judaism in the sense that when did, all, did, all, did it all start? Uh, we don't have a specific prophet or a guru. Like, for example, when we say Jesus Christ or after Jesus, then Paul came and, and, and uh, preached the gospel, right? Uh, and so, so that, that, is really, that is really very difficult. But I would say, of course, thousands of years, that's why we cannot change. Uh, like the caste system, um, India became in, independent only in the last century. So, uh, so uh, what we're looking at many layers of culture uh, and, and society. But I think, that, uh, I think that the appreciation for all this older the Judaism and Hinduism is that it has extend, ex extended a profound impact in the uh, lives that we even we have now. Uh, just a few days ago, that was yesterday or two days ago, uh, in India, in northern India, they inaugurated a huge temple. I, I saw it under construction. It's the temple to Ram. And it's connected to the politics of India. You see, religion causes conflict, but it also religion causes a lot of good things. Um, and sometimes when religion is embedded with nationalism, with feelings of superiority over another, uh, and so the, in terms of the most recent story, uh, a number of years ago, there was a, uh, a denunciation of a, a, a mosque uh, and 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 there was a there were riots and uh, uh, and then uh, then they replaced the mosque with this huge uh, temple to uh, to to Ram. It's it's magnificent. It's really awesome uh, a place. Now, I would like to 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 connect with you to to this notion of uh, uh, to 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 this notion in your handout about uh, Devi, Durga, Kali, Lakshmi, and Parvati. Um, I cannot discuss the details right now, but one, one thing that's very significant is the, the, a woman is represented as a god or goddess. That's very, very significant. So it's not, it's not just telling us that gods are males. They have females. In fact, I would say that gods have androgynous qualities. Okay? So, so that's, that's really uh, key. So the, uh, women... Uh, gods, that's really important. Another is this notion of samsara, the notion that um, there's reincarnation or cycle of birth and rebirth. And then the end of that is what is moksha. Now, I love the word lila uh, because it connotes play. You know, this is all a divine play. You know, we're all actors. We're all people who have assigned roles. And so if I'm a warrior, I fight. If I'm a priest, I, I perform rituals. We have our role in the whole divine lila. And we progress. And so in Hinduism, there are stages of life. There's the child, and then there's the student. And we are students. We are all students until a certain age. And then we become householders. And so during that time, we, we look for uh, what will sustain our family as a householder. And then, uh, and then there's the period of retirement. The notion of retirement in Hinduism is not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, James, it's not going to Sun City West <laughs> and turning off things. It's about, this is now your opportunity to learn. I love that concept in Hinduism. It is so lovely to think that, okay, now you have raised your kids, you're taking care of grandkids. That's, the, that's one sign, right, of, of, of that uh, period. And so now you can pursue your own uh, things. And so I know that uh, Chuck here uh, <laughs> is pursuing what, 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 whatever he, he wants to pursue. Have you had the chance? Yeah, in retirement? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Isn't that beautiful? No, I find that to be, to be beautiful. And then some people renounce 
renounces, are, are called renunciants or sannyasin. They really dedicate themselves to others uh, uh, in many uh, different ways. And so, um, you know, um, you might, there's a citation to the video. You might want to watch the video again. Um, if you Google puja, P-U-J-A, -P uh, you will find so many pujas <laughs> done in various homes and shrines and so forth. And so let me go back to the golden rule uh, and to, to do, do, do to others. I think Hinduism is a key religion, really very, very, very key religion in the sense that I will think of others and in terms of school of thought and philosophy, uh, we have this fancy word in the philosophy called deontological. And what does that mean? Bob, did you encounter study this? Being. Study of being? No, uh, that is ontological. Oh, I thought you saw that. De de deontological. De Deontology. Deontology means, uh, what is my duty? So what is my duty as a student? I have to study. Oh, be a doctor. <laughs> That's what the Hindu parents would tell you. Be a doctor. OK, uh, what, is, what is a householder? What is the duty of the householder? To take care of his family. So that's your duty. What, you're a warrior. You fight. You're a teacher. You teach. So I always ask myself, what is your duty? And so uh, Hinduism, in terms of the ethics of Hinduism, come from a deontological school. You ask yourself, what is my duty? What ought I to do? And then another thing about Hinduism that's so beautiful is that I go one step forward. What is my duty to God? And then with the thought that I am interacting with God, I am seeing God, and so I am having that connection with God. And so God and I are having that kind of a relationship. In that sense of me honoring God and God reciprocating the, the same love and devotion to me. So uh, Krishna, do you have any comments uh, before we conclude? Uh, uh, turn on your mic, Krishna. Brahman. Yes. So, you know, even though we have different names and forms and all that, we are all the same. So it's an attitudinal change that you have to bring to your mind to look on everyone as yourself. You are part of the same thing. So it's one big family, the whole world. I, I love that concept. And so it elucidates another concept that is in your study guide. It is called the Brahman. We're part of him uh, and the, our Atman, our eternal soul, is part of God. So there is that connection. And so when I say Namaste, I, Chuck, I honor the God within you. And you do the same to me. Anita is there. Anita, will you make your comments, please? Anita Rangaswamy, our Hindu representative. Yes, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Dr. Saloza Albert, for such a wonderful lecture. I was just thinking that this is so comprehensive, all in one hour. <laughs> the cover, and it's thousands of years. Of yeah. And you've done a fabulous job to just do it all in one hour. So, kudos. Uh, namaste. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and so, and I can't add anything else to what Albert has said, but um, I do want to comment on the Vasudeva uh, yeah, Kutumbakam, which is what you just mentioned, that uh, it is all one family in the yes. sense that, that, the, that the term should not be misinterpreted. And it's very important to understand that uh, clearly. But this is not the time or the place to get into that. Yes. But that is a concept within uh, the Hindu uh, uh, tradition as well. Yes. And, and I hope sometime when we get into some details, we can study Bhagavad Gita or yoga. Uh, Anita taught yoga. And so she probably, we would revive your yoga teaching, Anita, and then share with us uh, some of those things. So I really thank you very much. Uh, let us do, uh, let us 
do to others what we want done to ourselves, and that's in a more positive kind of way. So thank you, thank Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, I, just a couple uh, comments right here at the end is that uh, one of the things I always love to work with students is, is to do a research paper on the influence of Hinduism on American culture. And, and really, who knows when the first Hindu teachings came to America? Do you know, I mean, what, what would you say, Albert? First Hindu teachings. Well, early, early in the late 1700s, uh, translations of the Bhagavad Gita became available, and people like, sorry, who's the, who wrote Walden? Uh, Thoreau. 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 Did, well, uh, David, Henry David Thoreau was reading the Bhagavad Gita when he was out there, out there in the forest, uh, living, trying to live on his own in the land. He was, his neighbors were really quite close, but he was out there reading the Bhagavad Gita and reflecting on that. But Hindu teachers were actually coming through writings, and later in the, in the mid-1800s, Hindu teachers were coming to America to, to teach uh, very early on. And so if you start doing a little research on that, you find that uh, Hinduism and the teachings of uh, the many different Hindu religions, Indian religions, have had a big impact on American culture. Uh, so, just to, I just want to throw that in there at the end. I think Krishna, Krishna has something else to oh, say. Krishna, Krishna, go ahead. There's an excellent book called American Yoga, which traces exactly that. When did Hindu parts start coming into the West, into America? And it's very interesting. American and Yoga. And, yeah, Emerson and Toro and all of them were the beginning uh, pioneers. The, tran I, the transcendentalist movement of the early to mid yes. 1800s, you know, to mid 1800s is all coming out of the connection between. Anyway. Uh, so we owe, we owe a lot to India, yeah. uh, sometimes I call it Mother India, mm -hmm. and, and w when, when history is written 50 years from now, you will cite so many uh, uh, Indian influences uh, in our culture right now, and the Indian people, and how they shape Absolutely. American yeah. culture. Nikki, Nikki, Haley. Nikki, Nikki Haley. Haley is actually from India, as well as Kamala uh, Harris has his, his Indian yeah, background as well. Yeah, yeah, both of them have Indian backgrounds. So our next discussion will be about Sikhism. Uh, we'll do some alter, uh, alternate scheduling, and I will discuss that with Mike. But it's always a profound, uh, I'm always excited to be with you learning about and talking about all this religion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next week here for a okay.